Good morning, once again. Good morning, everyone. Come on, I need it a little louder than that. Good morning, everyone. Everybody happy to be here on our Friday Brain Trust. Uh, once again, I'm Congresswoman Karen Bass, and I would like to welcome everyone to the annual Africa Brain Trust. This year's um, annual legislative conference, the theme of this year is defining the, the moment and building the movement. And I think we are at such a historical moment right now, the ending of the first African American president. Uh, I believe we are preparing for a new administration and I am confident about her administration. I don't want to take anything for granted or be cavalier, but I have faith in the American people and I think it's going to go the right way. And so the theme of today from the Africa perspective is what should U.S. policy be in the next administration? Does that sound like a good topic for today? Um, before we begin, let me tell you that we're going to try a little experiment here, unless I'm wrong, and I hope one of my staff will point it out to me if I am, but uh, typically when you do translation, you have it simultaneous, right? Translator and a person speaking. Uh, this time we are going to try to do it up here on the screen. Am I right? Is that still, are we aiming for that? Okay, so uh, you know how a, a person that speaks would read a teleprompter? Well, instead of the person speaking reading the teleprompter, you guys will be reading the speech as it goes. Now, if there's a glitch, we will refer back to the traditional way of doing uh, translation simultaneous, but that is what we're going to strive for. Does that sound okay with everyone? So I want to take this opportunity to thank Chevron for their consistent and strong support of the Africa Brain Trust. I mentioned that today's forum is not only special in terms of our speaker, but it's also special in terms of timing and subject matters. We are going to begin with a keynote presentation in a minute. We are fortunate to have a head of state here, who I will introduce in just a minute. Later on uh, this afternoon, we will have the African Union Commissioner for Trade and Industry, Fatima Haram Asil. And we're going to have the Honorable Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, Linda Thomas Greenfield. Uh, I'm honored to also be joined by a host of renowned expert panelists who will participate in three key panels. So we're going to have a keynote speaker and then a panel. After the panel, we will have a short time period for questions and answers. So in terms of timing, I don't have to tell everyone I repeat, we are 51 days away from a national election here in the United States. And so this election, we know, is going to set the political pace not only for this country, but for Sub-Sahara Africa and for the world for decades to come. So in terms of substance, today's forum examines what priorities the next U.S. administration should pursue in Africa. Our three distinguished officials will address respectively issues regarding Mozambique's experience with economic development, the importance of infrastructure in improving the quality of life in developing countries, and the current and future role of an integral co uh, continental institution, the African Union. Our expert moderators and panelists will convene in three panels addressing these issues. And as always, as I mentioned, we will make time for questions and answers. Uh, we ask that audience members wishing to ask a question or make a comment, state your name and affiliation followed by a comment. One thing that we don't do here is we don't force people to ask questions because our experience is most people don't really want to ask a question anyway. They, they want to make a comment and you're free to make your comment. We would just ask you not to make a keynote speech. So <laughs> with that, I am going to move straight into the program. I really have an incredible uh, pleasure and honor of introducing and welcoming His Excellency, Felipe Jacinto Niusi, the fourth president and chief of state of the Republic of Mozambique, a nation nearly twice the size of California with a population of 25 million people. President Niusi was elected as president on October 15, 2014. Prior to becoming the president, he served as Mozambique's Minister of National Defense 
and was formerly the executive director of Mozambique's Ports and Railways, a major public entity he joined in 1992. As president, he has prioritized managing challenges associated with the country's sovereign debt and a slowing economy aggravated by a regional El Nino link drought. He has also sought to expedite the ongoing development of Mozambique's world-class natural gas reserves and maintain productivity in the coal sector. His government has also sought to privatize some state-owned corporate holdings. President Niusi has pursued enhanced regional economic cooperation, and I understand that earlier this month, the governments of Mozambique, Botswana, and Zimbabwe signed a memorandum of understanding to build a long-planned 1,600-kilometer freight railway linking Botswana to coastal Mozambique. Now, that's what I call regional development. Please join me. Please stand and join me in welcoming his Excellency, Felipe Jacinto Niusi, President of the Republic of Mozambique. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Senhora Karen Bess, co-presidente da conferência, senhores membros do Congresso Nacional Black Caucus, distintos representantes do governo dos Estados Unidos, estimados membros do governo de Moçambique, senhores membros do corpo diplomático, distintos participantes, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. Constitui para mim uma grande honra e privilégio tomar parte nesta importante conferência que anualmente debate questões de grande interesse para o futuro dos Estados Unidos da América, com precursões para o mundo inteiro e, em particular, para a África. Quero felicitar a congressista Karen Bess, a co-presidente desta conferência, pela sua valiosa, consistente e duradoura contribuição à causa da amizade e de consolidação da parceria entre os nossos dois povos. O seu papel durante o processo de libertação e autodeterminação dos povos africanos, através do Comitê para a África Austral e a incansável luta que vem travando para o progresso dos povos da África, são obras bem visíveis. Apesar da conjuntura do momento marcada pela Guerra Fria, desestabilização da região austral de África pelo regime racista do Apartheid, os nossos dois países, desde 1975, ano da nossa independência, sempre mantiveram uma interação baseada no respeito pela soberania e igualdade de direitos entre os dois Estados. Hoje, não há motivo de preocupação. Podemos afirmar com satisfação e convicção que os Estados Unidos da América e Moçambique lograram construir uma relação de profunda amizade, uma parceria sustentada em valores e interesses comuns e uma plataforma de diálogo construtivo com elevado índice de maturidade e de confiança. Em momentos de agudas dificuldades e crises, como foram as calamidades naturais, o período de conflito armado, da fome, da reconstrução econômica e social pós-conflito, o apoio multiforme na busca e consolidação da paz e da transição para a economia do mercado, bem como o crescimento econômico sustentável, foi porque os Estados Unidos da América fizeram-se presentes. Ao longo do percurso de relacionamento bilateral, temos constatado uma coerência e regularidade nas nossas políticas externas. Para o alcance deste legado que nos orgulha, temos contado com a valiosa contribuição do Congresso norte-americano e congressistas de todas as orientações políticas que comungam os valores da liberdade 
independência política e econômica, democracia, paz e prosperidade para todos. A estes vai o nosso mais vivo reconhecimento. Estamos convictos que, com a inestimável contribuição do Congresso, dos congressistas e, em especial, do Black Caucus, esta bandeira de boa convivência continuará a flutuar bem alto no próximo ciclo governativo nos Estados Unidos de América. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, hoje as relações entre os Estados Unidos da América e Moçambique ficam patentes na cada vez crescente relação econômico-comercial, nos investimentos e no intercâmbio sociocultural mais robusto. Esta tendência observa-se igualmente na relação cada vez mais dinâmica no nível parlamentar e instituições que corporizam a democracia. A este propósito, registramos com agrado a intensidade na troca de visitas de parlamentares entre os dois países, tendo a última visita de congressistas norte-americanos sido realizada no pretérito mês de agosto. Os Estados Unidos da América mantém-se como um parceiro importante e forte, apoiando em áreas de desenvolvimento prioritárias como a de práticas de boa governação e da melhoria do ambiente de negócios. No domínio econômico e comercial, é encorajador notar a presença cada vez mais crescente de empresas norte-americanas em vários ramos, maximizando o enorme potencial de Moçambique. A prazo nos registrar as companhias americanas que já estão a operar no país, tal como a General Electric, a Ana Darko, a ExxonMobil, Chicago Bridges e Infraestruturas, Symbion, a Coca-Cola, só para citar algumas. O eco que temos ouvido é o de que mais empresas interessam-se em operar no nosso país, sobretudo na exploração de hidrocarbonetos e outras áreas ajusantes, como a logística e a petroquímica. O impacto do investimento norte-americano vai para além dos 16 bilhões de dólares já investidos até este momento, tendo criado mais de 4 mil postos de emprego. Esta presença constitui um estímulo para o surgimento de pequenas e médias empresas, ajusante dos grandes projetos nos setores de hidrocarbonetos, agricultura, indústria, pescas, transportes, turismo e serviços. O mecanismo AGOA tem sido outro impulsionador do crescimento das exportações do nosso país. No contexto da nossa visita, participamos ontem num fórum empresarial organizado pela Corporate Council for Africa, desafiamos os empresários norte-americanos e moçambicanos a serem mais ambiciosos, criando mais parcerias de investimentos. Caros congressistas, distintos convidados, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, permitam-me, nesta ocasião, reiterar o compromisso do meu governo de continuar a cooperar com os Estados Unidos da América, fortalecendo a confiança mútua existente dentro dos altos valores e princípios que regem as boas práticas de governação e de negócios. Estamos convictos que juntos trilhamos o caminho certo no aprofundamento de uma parceria mutualmente vantajosa em benefícios dos nossos dois países. E muito obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Can we have another round of applause for our president? I'd like to call up our moderator for our neck for our first panel uh, of the day, Clarence Lusane, Dr. Clarence Lusane, who is a prolific author, 
author of many, many books, and his latest book uh, is called The Black History of the White House, and I would encourage you all to read of that book. Uh, he is an activist, a lecturer, and he is the chair of the political science department at Howard University and was formerly a tenured professor at American University. Join me in welcoming Clarence Lusane to the stage, and we will uh, bring up our first panel. Thank you very much. Everyone, take a one 30 second stretch as we bring our next panel up. Welcome everybody to the first panel. As Congresswoman uh, Bass indicated, this is an all-day program where we will be looking at issues of development uh, regarding economic development, education, health, uh, security, and democracy. Uh, that was a, a uh, excellent presentation uh, by the President. Uh, the emphasis on continuing cooperation uh, at many different levels, at the level of government, at the level of civil society, at the level of the private sector. And so those are some of the issues that we want to dig in uh, deeply. Uh, as uh, Congresswoman Bass indicated, I'm Clarence Hussein. I'm the chair of the political science department at Howard University. Our format today is pretty straightforward. Our panelists will introduce themselves. They will speak for two to three minutes uh, and give an overview of the important work that they're doing. Then we will have a, sh a brief period up until about 10.20 where the panelists will have a discussion about some of the key issues uh, based on questions that I will pose and questions that we've developed together. And then uh, beginning at around 10.20, uh, the floor will be open and uh, you'll be able to come up and ask questions, uh, make brief statements, uh, and we'll be able to have exchange and engagement. So uh, moving forward, let me start to my left uh, and have uh, Mrs. Uh, Miss, excuse me, uh, Ann May Chang introduce herself. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here today with such an esteemed panel. Um, my name is Ann May Chang. I am currently serving as a Chief Innovation Officer as well as the Executive Director of the U.S. Global Development Lab at USAID. For those of you who may not be familiar with USAID, USAID is a U.S. government's lead foreign aid agency. And so our focus is really on global development and humanitarian aid with a top line goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030. The Global Development Lab is the newest bureau at USAID. We were created about two and a half years ago to serve as an innovation hub for the agency. What that means is that we take smart risks to test out new ideas, particularly in the areas of science, technology, innovation, and partnerships. And then we work across USAID and with our developing, development partners to harness the power of these new tools, approaches, and actors to accelerate our progress towards tackling some of the toughest challenges in the world. Before coming to DC, uh, my background was actually in the technology sector. I worked for about 23 years in Silicon Valley, studied as a software engineer, and worked at companies like Apple and Google. And so 
Coming to DC, one of the things I'm very excited about is bringing the power of innovation and technology that I really was able to see firsthand in Silicon Valley to the work that we're doing in global development. Africa has been a long time priority for USAID because the success of Africa has been a long time priority for USAID because the success of Africa is good for not only Africa but also the United States. Our work reflects our shared interests in security, prosperity, and inclusive societies. I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, panelist who will give our opening statement is uh, Ms. Patricia Shake. Okay, thank you, Clarence. It's also an honor for me to be on this panel. Uh, I, uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about myself. I have over uh, 30 years of experience in agribusiness, especially in the trade and development arena. Uh, prior to coming to the Corporate Council on Africa, uh, I served uh, at uh, USDA in various capacities looking at both trade and development and also bringing the two um, areas together, which is a very difficult task, bringing trade and development together in order to promote economic development. So uh, I thought I would just tell you um, what I feel is needed in terms of uh, moving forward on agribusiness in, uh, in Africa. And the reason why agribusiness is so important is because uh, agriculture is the largest employer of people in Africa. And so if you get this sector right, then you have the ability to impact GDP rates of growth in a real way. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been gotten right. Uh, there are opportunities along the full value chain in ag agribusiness. And when I talk about the value chain, I'm referring to production, uh, processing, and then um, packaging of those agricultural commodities. And uh, for a lot of young people, they, they see uh, agriculture as just farming. But uh, when we talk about agriculture, we're talking about applying science, technology uh, to that uh, industry so that you can bring it into the modern world. And so if you look at countries like the United States or the European Union or Australia or New Zealand, these are multi-billion dollar industries in terms of agribusiness. And this is how important it is. It fuels a lot of jobs. And so uh, there's no reason why Africa couldn't do the same. Uh, under the AGOA legislation, which started in 2000, Africa started off exporting basically raw uh, commodities to the U.S., and they still basically do that in terms of coffee and tea. But over the course of this legislation, Africa has diversified somewhat its exports to the United States, and so they're now exporting uh, high-value products like wood products, like uh, fishery products, and uh, now countries like Cote d'Ivoire are moving into processed cocoa, and uh, we're very proud that Namibia recently got approval, the first African country to be granted approval to export beef to the United States. That is no small uh, accomplishment. Many countries that are developed cannot do that. So, um, so there is movement. Uh, I also would say that the, a the uh, African Union plays a very important role in the development of the agribusiness sector. And uh, they established a program called the Comprehensive African Afri Agricultural Development Program, or CADAP, and those countries in the, uh, that are members of the African Union that have pledged 10% of their GDP to, uh, to agriculture have witnessed the largest rates of growth in uh, productivity. And many of those countries, I don't have all of them with, with me, but many of them include uh, countries like Cote d'Ivoire and Ethiopia, where the government is actually putting money into the agribusiness sector. So um, what is needed to make a GOA work? Uh, there has to be more technical as assistance in the regulatory arena for agriculture, both for meat and uh, uh, food products, also in terms of food safety, so that they can meet our requirements. There needs to be more work in marketing, understanding the market of the United States. If you're going to export tomatoes, for example, to the United States, you need to know who your comp competition is, and it's Mexico, and they're right on our border. So do you really want to do that when they have the advantage of shipping because of close proximity to the United States? These are the kind of things that, that need to be taken into account. Not that you can't do it, but you need to take those economic factors into account. We need to encourage more investment from large U.S. food companies. You heard 
excuse me, you heard Congressman Bass talk, uh, I'm sorry, not con the President of Mozambique talk about Coca-Cola. So companies are in Africa and they've been there for decades and uh, we should encourage them to do more because it's in their business interest to invest in these countries. And we want more involvement from the diaspora. They understand the culture and the climate with regard to small, medium-sized enterprises. Now, of course, African governments have responsibilities too, and they need to enact policies that are conducive to allow trade and investment to occur. They have to have a good business enabling environment, uh, and they have to have a commitment to infrastructure, energy, and the growth of their universities so that they can be on the cutting edge of science and technology. And encourage the uh, aggregation of smallholder farmers so that they can get economies of scale. Thank you. Thank you. And our third panelist uh, who will uh, introduce herself is Ms. Uh, Janine Scott. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Janine Scott. Uh, like my friend and colleague, Pat, I too uh, have over 30 years of experience primarily in the development and humanitarian arenas. I had two iterations during which I served time with AfriCare, both here in the United States as well as abroad lastly serving as its senior vice president for about seven or eight years. Um, following a career with Africa or in between, I served in the multilateral world. I was at the African Development Bank for a decade where I served first as an officer and then I was appointed as the advisor and the deputy to the U.S. Executive Director representing the United States. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, as uh, the deputy and advisor to the U.S. executive director uh, representing the United States at the African Development Bank. Um, it's when I returned here to the States that I was serving as the uh, vice president for Africa. Thereafter, and which I've just finished in the past couple of months, I served for five years as the um, president of the U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce. And I've seen my career uh, kind of developing in a continuum. Uh, starting with really hardcore humanitarian and on-the-ground development assistance types of programming. But as things evolve, as the continent has evolved, I think my career too has followed that path and has evolved. And it's brought me to where I am currently, which is the founder and principal of my own company, which is America to Africa Consulting, where I am providing uh, business assistance and brokering um, and project brokering uh, to those who are looking to invest uh, in the continent to find partners and to look for uh, the financial means to be able to do so. Um, it's a, a daunting and challenging task, but I think that given the years of experience that I have had on the continent, that it's a full course, it's a full culmination uh, to be able to do that, to work with diaspora companies and to work with the SME sector in particular and to bring many of the things that uh, I see, or I see opportunities to the African continent. Thank you, thank you. As you can hear, not only do our panelists have many years of experiences, but more important, deep wisdom about Africa and the experiences uh, that they brought, that they've learned from, uh, and that we hear as they talk about the work that they're doing now. Uh, we have time, I think, for probably two or three questions to be posed from me to the panelists uh, before we open it up. Uh, my first question relates to a discussion that the four of us had uh, over the phone as we were preparing for this, and that's around capacity building. And what, my, uh, what I would like to, to have them respond to is to explain the complexities and multiple dimensions of capacity building as it relates to Africa at this particular moment. And perhaps uh, we can reverse and we can start with uh, Ms. Scott. Okay. Um, yes, capacity building is something I think we're talking, let's look at it writ large. You've got education, you've got training, you've got vocational education, uh, you've got um, a basket of things that need to go into it. And I think when we're looking at development and the needs uh, that underpin sustained development, um, it is really upon us to look at what those needs are and how we would be in a, a position uh, to, to fulfill them. Um, there are many institutions and many ways that that can be done. 
Um, we have HBCUs, for example. I was on a panel the other day that looked at some of the issues with regard to trade and investment uh, in Africa. The issue of uh, how we may be able to do partnering with HBCUs uh, on both sides, uh, providing uh, training uh, for professors, for students. Um, there are issues of entrepreneurial training. There are issues of business training. Um, we need to look at how we're able to, to bring about uh, harnessing the, the, the things that U.S. entrepreneurs have, bring them to bear in Africa. That would be some of the first things that I would say on that. All right, I think Janine covered a full gamut of what's needed, but uh, just to try to touch upon uh, uh, some of the areas she didn't touch upon so that we can have a fuller discussion, uh, including the uh, HSBC use, I think that uh, also Native American um, colleges and universities, because these are folks that uh, farm on very small plots of land and they've been very creative. I know that when I was at USDA, we tried to work with the uh, Native American colleges and universities and some of them have done quite well in terms of forestry management uh, as an example. Uh, I would also say that um, foundations can help, uh, and they are helping, and that we need to expand that. And we also need to use the, the uh, services that we have of the U.S. government officials that are on the ground in uh, some mm -hmm. of these countries. For example, in sub-Saharan Africa, there have been the cre uh, creation of trade hubs in um, South Africa, in Kenya, and in, um, in uh, Ghana. Uh, and uh, we, we have uh, both the State Department officials uh, agricultural attaches that are technical experts in those uh, countries and also uh, folks from the regulatory agencies I know in, in uh, Kenya. So we need to take advantage of those folks that are on the ground that know some of these technical issues that could help them. And uh, we need to also train um, uh, the universities, as I said in my opening statements, in these countries that are heavily involved in extension work. It starts at the farmer level. And many farmers are very, very smart individuals. You just need to show them what needs to be done. And believe me, if, if you show them, they will do it because they do know how to farm. It's just that they don't know some of the techniques. And I think, uh, lastly but not leastly, in terms of agriculture, uh, there's got to be a, a, a real addressing of the um, seeds that uh, farmers are using for planting to ensure that they're the highest yielding seeds uh, and so that they can get the highest yield for the efforts that they're putting into their product. Thank you. Ms. Chang? Yeah, this is a, a great topic. Capacity building has certainly been a priority for USAID across the work that we do. I'll focus uh, specifically because uh, Patricia and Janine have really covered a uh, pretty wide gamut there, uh, specifically on some of the shifts in capacity building needs that I think are going to be required with the advent of the digital economy globally. Um, and so I think there's implications of the digital economy where we're seeing the most vibrant and fast growth around the world in terms of the kind of capacities we need to build both for individuals and for institutions in Africa. On the individual level, this means increasing levels of digital literacy, um, particularly for women. We're seeing as um, powerful tools like mobile phones and the internet become much more widespread that there's a gender gap in access to these technologies and, and bridging the digital literacy divide is an important part of making sure that women don't get left further and further behind. We also are looking at things like STEM education, which is really important to build the kind of um, expertise that is going to be needed in the digital economy, as well as skills around entrepreneurship, as we see a shift more and more from traditional jobs to more of the kind of gig economy jobs that are, we're seeing much more now in the United States and we think we'll also see across Africa going forward. On the government side of things, we think capacity building is also important in order for Africa to truly harness all of the potential that comes with the digital economy. This can involve things like policy and regulation to create an enabling environment to allow these types of th technologies to thrive and to be taken maximal advantage of. So just two examples here. 
One is on internet connectivity, and USAID has worked with over 70 partners to create an alliance called the Alliance for Affordable Internet that's promoting best practice and policy and regulation that will ensure competitive and open markets and market efficiency so that access to the internet will be affordable and that more people can get online. Today, only about 25% of people in Africa are online, so there's a huge upside potential. And in the 21st century, we believe that connectivity is an essential um, infrastructure for development along the lines of roads and bridges, electricity and water. Communities and individuals and countries need internet connectivity to not only survive but thrive. In fact, McKinsey has done a study that, in, that um, indicates that if we were to really develop the full potential of the internet in Africa, we would have over $300 billion of productivity gains. And finally, one other area is the area of electronic payments. Um, we're seeing uh, mobile payment systems thrive, particularly in Kenya and in East Africa. Um, and we've been involved in starting up the um, Better Than Cash Alliance, which is, again, a public-private partnership to promote the use of electronic payments. Uh, Moody's has estimated that globally the increased GDP growth from electronic payments has been equivalent to 1.9 million jobs being created. So there's huge upside potential in expanding access to the Internet and expanding access to electronic financial services. Thank you. Yes, and if uh, other panelists want to re uh, respond. I just want to say that um, apart from the gender gap, I think that, uh, and it's not just in the IT sector, one of the things we have to be cognizant of uh, when we speak about uh, the continent in general is the absolute enormity of the youth bulge and what that means. And I think that it, it may seem obvious, but at the same time, I think we have to be very cognizant of the fact that we do have so many young people that the population of the young people um, is really multiplying uh, in a few years' time. Uh, and when we look at capacity building initiatives or training initiatives uh, as we're looking at building economies, that we really do have to be cognizant of the role that they play um, to have them uh, gainfully engaged moving forward. Um, because if we don't look at them as uh, people that should really be able to partake in ways, productive ways in the economy, then we'll, we'll be facing other issues down the road. Um, I think that the, that the uh, what N.A. said about the Internet is extremely important, uh, but I also think that we need to turn to the young people because they are Internet connected. And we should be looking to them to provide us with some of these creative and innovative ways. Believe me, they're communicating with one another across borders. And so I just want to make sure that we don't leave them out of the equation because they may be able to tell us some of the things that need to be done. Thank you. Uh, as you've heard, uh, our three panelists gave a wide array of areas in which capacity building uh, needs to occur and should be occurring. And that relates to the second question I want to want to ask. Uh, the theme for today looks at what to expect from the next administration. And while there will be clearly NGO involvement and private sector involvement, uh, there will also be government to government involvement. As the President of Mozambique uh, discussed, the relationship with the U.S. government is, is really critical. So my question for the panelists are, is if you're advising whoever comes in in January as the next government of the United States, next leading government, uh, what would be your top three priorities relative to Africa that you would advise the administration to focus on? Am I starting? Um, thank you. It's, of course, very difficult to pick only three priorities. <laughs> um, I would say it, um, two that I would start with are, I think, that USAID, uh, in partnership with agencies across the U.S. <coughs> government, has made tremendous progress through both our Feed the Future program and Power Africa program over the last several years. Um, we're very pleased that Congress has now passed authorizing legislation in the form of the Electri Electrify Africa Act and the Global Security Act. And I certainly hope that these will be priorities going forward that really are core to driving economic development in Africa. 
And so if I could offer a third, um, sort of building on my point about internet connectivity, we're starting to see an increased focus um, now with the Global Connect initiative coming out of, uh, being led out of the State Department that of a focus on expanding connectivity. And I think this means investments along a number of levels, both on building the, those digital skills, on building the policy environment. In addition, experimenting with technologies that can reach people in areas that don't currently have coverage, particularly in rural areas, and also expanding actual infrastructure to provide access to more people. And so, one of the priorities that I hope the next administration will build upon is really making internet connectivity front and center of part of our development initiatives because I do believe that access to the internet is foundational because it allows people to access information for healthcare, for agriculture, it allows people to access markets both locally and globally, it allows people to find jobs, it allows people to connect use technology to make their businesses more efficient and productive. And so I, th I see this as an essential piece of driving e economic growth across Africa in the next 10 years. Janine? Um, well, I think that this administration for the past seven plus years has had a number of programs and initiatives that have been uh, very successful and they've continued some from the past but I think again Power Africa, Trade Africa, uh, the US uh, Africa Business Forum, the fact that the OGOA legislation um, was extended for an additional 10 years, um, the President also has created the Doing Business on Africa Advisory Council and I think that those are all initiatives that have had some positive and strong impacts and they're things that should be um, certainly continued. Um, I've been having this conversation uh, a little bit all week, so some of the things that I've heard uh, as well, and, in, 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 and they relate to some things that I'm thinking as well, um, is in terms of financing, the U.S. Uh, being able to maybe find ways or means to assist uh, its business sector, particularly smaller businesses, to find opportunities for financing opportunities, be it with uh, financial institutions that exist or creating um, uh, institutions that may specifically address this need. We see a lot more from other countries. There may be best practices or something that we can learn from others who are actually in country uh, or in countries in Africa uh, from other countries who are able to, to do uh, more easily what our U.S. businesses sometimes have difficulties in doing. Um, I would maintain the programs that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I would also say that um, the role of the HBCUs could certainly be looked at, uh, including a role for the diaspora. I think, again, the diaspora is something that continues to come up to clearly define the diaspora and also to ensure that uh, they are um, they are uh, queried when with regard to programs and initiatives and included uh, with regard to uh, programs that we would like to see rolled out. Um, and I think the other thing that I would like to say is the Doing Business on Africa Council um, could perhaps, uh, I know their, their information is published, but to do a little bit more to make sure that their recommendations are actually implemented. Okay, so I'm going to start off from the basis of uh, <clears throat> saying that the, this election is a very different kind of election, and we don't, we're not really sure what will happen. But there has been a uh, continuity in uh, policies toward Africa, and hopefully uh, all of the policies that were mentioned uh, will be continued. Uh, let, let me just take you back a little bit. Uh, AGOA, when it was uh, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, when it was first um, passed, it had bi bipartisan support. Uh, we got the Millennium Challenge Corporation from the Bush administration. And then we got Feed the Future from the Obama administration. So all of these programs have been very, very helpful for Africa. And I think that hopefully we will see a continuity of policies toward Africa. I think that's very important because we've gotten some real good resort results from these policies, including PEPFAR, which was also uh, under a Bush administration. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is very, very important is that we expand the U.S. private sector involvement in Africa on trade and investment. 
uh, our companies are there in Africa, but they're not there in the way that um, other countries uh, are there and their companies. And uh, at some point, and I don't know if we've already missed a train, but we need to be there. And if, if six of the 10 largest, the fastest growing economies are in Africa, then I don't need to present an economic argument of why we should be there. We need to be there. And so um, I, I would say that we need to find out and we need to have more dialogue with our private sector because at some point um, Africa will point to another, someone else and say, uh, well, sorry, US. And then um, the, the, the last thing that I would say is that um, because, and I said this in the, my opening remarks, because agriculture employs the largest number of people, we've got to get that sector right. No country on, in the history of the world that has an agricultural sector that cannot feed its people and then use that surplus to export has ever made it in terms of economic development. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question among the panelists. I would ask people who have questions or comments to begin to line up uh, at the mic. Uh, so as soon as we finish the next question, you'll be able to jump right in. In what ways should U.S. civil society, the African American community, and as has been mentioned a number of times, the diaspora, understand the current economic state of African development? What are the similarities and the differences across the region? It's a hard question. <laughs> it's a complex question. I, I can't say that it has a, a pat answer. Uh, I think it is important to see that the, <coughs> the continent has, is home to some of the fastest growing economies. Um, at the same time, we have economies that have stagnated or continue to experience problems. So it's varied, it's complex. Um, we see the rise of democracy and governance with, I think, at least half of the, the presidents now uh, having come through a uh, democratically uh, elected <clears throat> process. Um, again, varying degrees of economic growth. Um, and some countries that were moving forward have been stymied by oil prices falling. Some that were on a good path, like Sierra Leone, have uh, seen Ebola come and wipe out some of the progress that they've made. And so there are those kinds of challenges that are socioeconomic. Then, of course, we have the infrastructure challenges that uh, I think plague uh, many of us when we try to go in to develop certain types of projects. Um, there are gaps uh, in manufacturing and supply side kinds of things that we might look for when we're going in to do business on the continent or even operate as an NGO. Um, and so I think that there are a variety of things. It's hard to paint a, a, a broad brush um, and it may be regional or country specific, but those are some of the kinds of things that I think people should be aware of when they look at the, the variances that exist. Okay, so I think that, you know, AGOA attempted to bring in the civil society, and I think that, you know, I don't know where you start because there are various levels of understanding among these three groups, but I think that expanding maybe on AGOA and bringing in the African American community and the diaspora would be a, a good start, and having U.S. government policies be more open with respect to bringing in all of these entities that could help us in terms of moving forward. Thank you. Africa is an incredibly diverse continent, so I think it's very difficult to generalize. But I think one of the things we can say is that there's huge opportunity, and we're very excited about that. One of the things that we've really seen emerging on the continent is that in the past, we often have come up with solutions to imp um, improve the lives of people from Africa here in the United States and, and outside Africa. But today, we're seeing more and more dynamism of entrepreneurs and innovators on the continent itself. One great example is in Uganda, a guy named Sanga Moses found that his 12-year-old sister was missing school because she was spending so much time going 10 kilometers to collect firewood. And so he came up with this great innovation of a simple machine that converts agricultural waste into briquettes that could be used for fuel that were cleaner, burned longer, and were 20% cheaper than fuel. 
So with, our, with funding from DIV, our Development Innovation Ventures Program at USAID, we've helped EcoFuel begin manufacturing and leasing these machines to people in the community and training them to launch their own businesses. And as of mid-2015, uh, EcoFuel had more than 20,000 customers and was producing 26 metric tons per day. And it's this kind of innovation on the continent of people who really understand the local challenges and the local cultures that we think are going to be a key to growth in Africa. Thank you. Okay, now it's your turn. And we will just go back and forth between the two mics. Uh, as was indicated earlier, uh, please give your name. Uh, your affiliation, if any, and then your uh, question, question slash short statement. All right. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And uh, I want to congratulate uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass for organizing this uh, Africa Brain Trust. I also congratulate the chair, the chair of this, uh, the moderator, Dr. Charles Luzin. You've demonstrated something that I really want to applaud. Well, my name is Ambassador Tunde Adetunji, born in Nigeria, and I'm the chair of the Africa Heritage Foundation. We started in 1996 during the Olympics to bridge the gap and build the bridge between the 55 nations of Africa and the diaspora. You raise a very vital point today but what has started since 1996 has actually been accomplished by this administration. To bring the indigenous, the intimate, and the distant Africans together is number one call. Reversing brain drain into brain gain is one of the missing points that we actually solve the Africa solutions. Most of the intellectuals that left the shore of Africa never return. I am a product of the diaspora. I work in Switzerland for 13 years as an instructor. I live in 110 cities in 57 countries. Now, when we started the foundation, the idea is to now form the diaspora. And uh, you mentioned human resources and capacity building for sustainable development, which is the main core. What we are discussing today is to eulogize Africa matters. Africa is the future. Africa is the continent of possibility, but how? I see so many things you've mentioned here today, which we will still really diagnose and also trash. But we want to move forward that Africa is the emerging marketing opportunity of the world. United States is missing so much in Africa economy. How do we revise that? How do we fix that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, sometimes the panelists may want to respond, other times they may not. So uh, we'll leave it up to the panelists. Oh, you want us to do one by question? No, no, question, just if you, you want to respond, because sometimes questions. people make statements, and the statements can stand for themselves. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, over there. Uh, my name is Gamechu Galgalu. Uh, my question is more general, and in fact, uh, the title itself says African Brain Trust. And as you all know, Africa is the big, uh, second largest continent in it, several countries in it. So when you talk about Africa, without talking about the countries in it, while the countries in it symbolizes several dictators and economy with a dictatorship often doesn't work together. So as you are advising the upcoming, the forthcoming uh, president, how you decipher dictatorship, economic development, and within the context of Africa, without talking about the countries in it? Someone like to respond? I wasn't quite sure if I understood. How do you do? No, I would just say I agree that Africa is an incredibly diverse continent and we can't treat all countries equally. Um, certainly we see countries that are really thriving. We also see countries that are um, more fragile and are struggling. And so we work um, across Africa with countries based on where they are and what their greatest needs are to build both prosperity but also democratic and res resilient societies. Joyce Rogers Holiday. 
the executive director of the International Association of African NGOs. What do you foresee would be the impact of the TPP and TTIP on sub-Saharan Africa? Some believe that it would have negative impact on the gains made on the Agoa. What are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you said TPP, and what's the other one? TTIP. 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 OK, so you're talking about the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement? Mm -hmm. I, right. And, then and, the, the, and, the, and the agreement with uh, the European Union, I presume, right? Yes. OK, so those, those are regional, as you know, regional trade agreements. And Africa is not included in those discussions. And uh, the, uh, the larger WTO, World Trade Organization discussions, which have been stalled for many, many years, includes uh, a much broader array of countries. Um, I think it puts pressure on the larger negotiations to get them concluded so that Africa and the others that aren't included in, 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 the, in either of those regional tr uh, free trade agreements are included. But you're right, they're not included, and so it puts pressure on that broader uh, World Trade Organization agreement to be completed and done. But that has been lingering for 20 years now. Another panelist like to respond? Because that's really an important question. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead, please. Good morning, good uh, morning. ladies and gentlemen, and the panelists. Uh, I want to take this time to extend our thanks and appreciation to Congress Omar Bass for carrying on the Bringing Trust on Africa. And I hope after today, we begin to engage the African diaspora to have uh, some sort of a more solution oriented for African countries in Africa. And also, uh, I, want to, I want to thank Dr. Lenz for writing your book and for sitting on that stage and representing the African diaspora. My concern here, yeah, I'm going to be more spe specific to Liberia. You said been in Liberia for so many years, and I can see anything they have built in our country. Recently, the Chinese government built a bridge to get the people from off sketch of Monrovia to the capital city of Monrovia. We are going to be 169 years old come next year, 2017. And we are so underdeveloped. So my question is to the Director for Global Development, what are you going to do? Because we tried for the last two years, the, the person you have in Liberia, we tried to engage that individual to see how we can be part of the process as Liberians in the diaspora to help that country. There's no running water in Liberia. There's no electricity. But yet instead, you say been there for almost over 50 years. What have you built going forward? What are you going to build? Building the human capacity, our health infrastructure, our educational infrastructure. Everything is broken down in Liberia. But yet instead, you say it's there. What are you building? I can see anything that you have built. Okay, thank you. For, thank you for your question. It's a USA question. It's a USA question. I can, I can talk generally about it. So, okay, and me. So I, I, um, I can't speak generally for all of our work in Liberia. That's not my area of expertise, but I'd be more than happy to put you in touch with our folks um, who work in Africa and Liberia to answer some of your more detailed questions. What I can say is what we're doing from the Global Development Lab standpoint. Um, and we've been involved in the Ebola, um, the response to the Ebola crisis and in the recovery. And our focus from the Global Development Lab standpoint, this is certainly not the whole of USAID's work, has really been in developing the communications infrastructure that we believe will be helpful in not only you know the 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 you know future potential outbreaks of disease to enable healthcare facilities and healthcare workers to communicate better to have um, information be shared better with the population and so we're we're doing work on helping build interoperable health information systems across West Africa as well as improving the digital connectivity within Liberia of course that is not nearly sufficient um, and we are doing a host of other work across Liberia, which I'm happy to put you in touch with our Africa colleagues um, to be able to share more with you and see how we might be able to engage more. Thank you. I can't speak from, from uh, 
present uh, current experiences, but I can say that uh, during the, the time, particularly my time uh, with Africare, that uh, there were programs in Liberia, and those programs were funded, funded by USAID, uh, principally in agriculture and health services, capacity building and the like. And um, I think that th the communities that were touched certainly did experience impacts from those projects. It's difficult to work in an entire country as a, a medium-sized uh, entity. But I would say that USAID has had a concerted presence in, in Liberia and that it has uh, worked in tandem with uh, NGOs such as an Africare um, in the past. Uh, it's been a few years since I left, but uh, certainly doing things on the ground. And I think that if you query some of the other organizations as well who work in partnership with USAID, you may also find some of the, the answers to the questions that you're looking for. Okay. The gentleman here. Good morning. My name is Morat Ekbal, and previously I served as Deputy Director of the Center for International Comparative Law. I've taught on three faculties at that university and have spent 20 years teaching at Howard University School of Law. I have two observations I want to offer and also two questions related to those observations. Uh, the title of this panel is uh, Economic Progress and Challenges on the Continent. And as one of the earlier questions alluded to, one of the challenges we face now uh, are that at least a couple of handful of countries in Africa are facing elections. And I personally do not know of a good way to avoid this ceremonial compliance where you have non-agenarians uh, running for office being re-elected in a single party system and we call it democracy, which it is not. Uh, you know, we cannot contest that, but they call it democracy and it's just uh, a continuation of the same problem. All the while, 10 years ago, as a member of an official delegation, I was in Khartoum, Sudan, then one country, now two, and when we arrived there, the hotel we were staying at, the Khartoum Hilton, was quite literally overrun by a Chinese delegation writing contracts. And so what this uh, lady spoke in Liberia, and I've had long-standing relationships with like, Liberia at all levels, uh, is true. Uh, you have China running across the entire continent writing contracts, which I personally as a lawyer would regard, and as a law professor, would regard as contracts of adhesion which serve the People's Republic of China for their natural resource bases. And on the other side, uh, you have a United States that is well-intentioned, has resources, but doesn't seem to know how to apply them effectively to compete in that area. The second question, and I'll be brief, is there's been a number of questions. The ambassador from Nigeria asked how. I would suggest all those present to take a look at a model that a colleague of mine has worked on. It's called the GeoNomos, nomos for the Latin word law. And it represents the interaction of three forms of capital, social capital, human capital, and financial capital, and allows a way to achieve that which has been talked about here at this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the panelists can respond. I would also just remind everyone that our third panel this afternoon will deal with uh, the issue of democracy in Africa. But uh, panelists may want to respond to the second question. Um, I, th I think, and it's uh, in line with what the ambassador is saying, the U.S. is missing so much in Africa, and I think I alluded to it a little bit in uh, some of the remarks that I made earlier as well, that one of the things um, that I think the U.S. may want to do in looking forward is to step back and examine why it is, to really look at what, why it is that you can see Turkey, Italy, Spain, Japan, many others go in, uh, China, uh, and sit down, uh, ink contracts, large companies, small companies. What are some of the things that we can take away? Not that we may want to replicate exactly what they're doing, but there must be something that they're getting right in what it is that they're doing. Otherwise, many of the opportunities that they seem to get, often where they, the governments or the private sector uh, companies that are signing, expressly state that we would really like to have Americans come into this sector. We would really like to work with American companies, um, but somehow we're missing the mark. And I think that we have to do that type of research, that type of study. And I think we have to have a really serious internal discussion with many of our policymakers and others who are structuring programs that do have impact, but somehow are still um, maybe missing the mark a little bit. And why, while we do have increased U.S. presence on the continent, 
it is certainly lagging behind. And there, in my opinion, it's not a good reason that I can think of for the world's leader in many respects to be lagging behind uh, on the continent of Africa. I would say also in my opening remarks, I talked about uh, whether it's too late now for the U.S. because of mm. all the many players. You know, some of the countries that you mentioned, especially China, let's just be honest, uh, it's a state-run economy, and they can do whatever they want to do, and they do. And so we're a rule of law economy, and so we're clashing already. And uh, they're coming in with billions of dollars, uh, and they also are taking out what they want. So that's what we're up against, but I do believe, like Janine said, we need to have a frank discussion, but we also need to have a frank discussion with our businesses. Why aren't you there? Because there are, there is money to be made, lots of money to be made in Africa. Why aren't you there? Thank you. you know, one thing I would just add is um, the, the, the uh, financing for development has changed dramatically over the last couple decades. While it used to be that official development assistance or foreign aid from the United States was dominated the financial flows from the U.S. to um, the developing countries, today um, most of, uh, foreign aid accounts for less than 9%. And so it's really dwarfed by the private sector investment, by diaspora engagement and remittances. And so the shape of how we're engaging as a development community, it needs to change as a result as well. And so we are actively engaging with the diaspora community. Um, and I invite you all to attend the Diasporas and Development event that's coming up on October 12th. Um, global diaspora remittances are estimated to be over $500 billion. Mm -hmm. And so we, we need to take advantage of those financial flows. We also need to take advantage of private sector companies. So for example, um, it, well, USAID is working with the government of Ethiopia and DuPont to uh, through a program called the Advanced Maize Seed Adoption Program. And what we're doing is working with them to have demonstration plots, uh, field se training sessions and building a network of farmer dealers to expand adoption of these much more productive seeds. And as a result, more than 30,000 farmers have started using these seeds and they've seen productivity of their yields increase by 300 percent. And so it's by engaging the, these new technologies, private sector companies, and so forth, that we can better leverage our development dollars and get not only one dollar's impact for one dollar we spend, but sustained development impact over time. Thank you. Okay, we're going to shift our format a little bit. We're going to take three questions or statements at a time uh, so that we ensure that we get more people. Hi, my name is Angelique Walker-Smith from Bread for the World. I'm the Senior Associate for Pan-African and Orthodox Church Engagement. And at Bread for the World, our commitment is public policies that's going to help end hunger and poverty. So we're very grateful for this morning's emphasis, particularly on agribusiness and things that will help in this area of work. We've been very strong on AGOA and also uh, Electrify Africa and related policies, not to mention Feed the Future and, of course, the Global Food Security Act. Um, I just first want to say thank you to this wonderful panel of insight and direction. I think this needs to get broader exposure, so however we're doing that with demand or whatever, I hope we'll promote that. That's one point. My, uh, I have two very quick questions. One is, as we know, there are the sustainable development goals. There's also the UN decade in solidarity with people of African descent. And of course, we have US policies. Generally speaking, because I know we don't have time, where do you see the intersectionality around these kinds of three public policy initiatives, uh, I would say, both global and then also national? Uh, just generally speaking, where do you see that intersectionality to further the goals that you mentioned this morning? And then second, relative to the civil society. One of the pieces that I have not heard this morning is the importance of the faith community, the indigenous faith community in Africa, the diaspora faith community, et cetera. So how do you see the role of faith, which is huge, fitting into some of the priorities that you've lifted this morning? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to try to get everybody that's standing in line, but uh, I'm asking that no one else come up because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Yes. Good morning. and. Um, I just wanted to ask a quick question. I know Ms. Uh, Ms. Scott and uh, Ms. Chang, you kind of touched on it about how uh, the diaspora should uh, make 
you know, contact with your agencies and these programs. But I wanted to know if you could elaborate a little bit more on how you see the diaspora uh, helping with the programs you're, you're running. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Florindo Shivokut from Friends of Eng Florindo Shivokut from Friends of Angola. Um, I was just wondering. I mean, we all know that develop economic development can be a source of conflict as well, especially when it's not inclusive. Uh, and uh, it's a classic example would be Angola, for instance, where a, there was economic development and uh, basically less than one percent accumulate the health and the remaining living in extreme poverty. Uh, and also, uh, so the so the, the internet connectivity in Angola, for instance, which is extremely important, is one of the highest in sub-Saharan Africa. But also we've seen instances where, uh, like the government just passed a legislation uh, to uh, really to put a letter um, um, to, to condemn the, uh, or to criminalize journalists and uh, probably put some filters into the internet, emulate China, and Zimbabwe also following suit as well. So uh, my question to you is, how can you balance economic development and uh, human rights issue, uh, which is, a, a, I mean, in Angola, it's a big problem, um, which is also a place where you have a, a uh, president who has been in power since I was born in 1979, and they still call democracy. Uh, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, let's take one more in this round. Hello, everyone. My name is Agnes. Yes. About uh, the diaspora, I don't okay. want to come back to what they said. What I ask you, Patricia and Anne, and to listen to what they said. We, diaspora, we feel that we are excluded. Uh, we are not in touch with you. We have skills, we have experience in both countries, where we come from and in the United States, and we want to be involved and about uh, African women. You remember what uh, Hillary, Miss Hillary said, that if in Africa, uh, African women decide to stop to work for one day, all African economy will collapse. But these women, they are working in informal. They don't have access to bank credit. What do you plan to help them? They need to be sustained, to be supported, and we need to make them the true entrepreneur. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, panelists? Um, let me take that last one first. I think that you are absolutely cor correct that the uh, impact uh, and the contributions of uh, women to economic development and just, just to the everyday uh, economies of uh, Africa is largely undercounted uh, because much of it is within the informal uh, sector. I think one of the things that we need to look more concertedly at, there are systems, traditional systems, local systems that exist to provide financing for uh, very small uh, enterprises and so forth, but that have been used as the launch pad by many women to uh, anchor themselves and their families and to provide uh, differing levels uh, of, of growth and, and investment to their own families and communities. So I think that we need to take a look, uh, look at some of those systems, the Tontine system, they have different names in different countries, to see how they may be leveraged, they may be formal, formalized, may be regulated or something, uh, such that they may be in a position to, uh, to be expanded and to really provide the impetus for some of the growth and the support that uh, you, you are speaking about. Um, uh, on that last one. Okay, uh, I think I'll take the one with uh, the gentleman from Angola, and I agree with you. Uh, I'm coming from the private sector, but the kind of questions you raise in terms of a balance between economic development and, and human rights uh, is, a, is a good one. Uh, it's, it's an area I think that uh, government folks need to make sure that there is this balance. I think they try in the programs that they have, but maybe they need to do more. Uh, and so maybe this is a very good topic for government folks to think more about. I do know that in the business world that uh, a business is going to look very carefully at their investment and whether they think it's safe 
and whether they think the economic climate and the human rights climate, there is this balance. And, and that's some of the reason why they go in some countries and they don't in others. But I do think you raise a very good point, but it's a, ultimately it's a government question and, and how vigorously uh, they want to pursue that balance. Thank you. I'll, I'll address the several comments on the diaspora. I um, appreciate the interest and attention on this issue. It is one that we think there is huge opportunity and um, much more that we can do there. Um, to the question of how do we want to engage the diaspora, I think the diaspora, we, I have seen diaspora be among some of the best entrepreneurs because they understand both the continent as well as, and their, na their native countries, as well as the global economy. And so we've seen very successful entrepreneurs as, uh, um, as diaspora. We've also seen them be great investors and philanthropists um, in their communities and their countries. Um, as well as volunteers. And so in recognition of this, the State Department and USAID started the International Diaspora Engagement Alliance in uh, 2011. And so that's a way that we are working towards engaging diaspora more deeply. And I'll just call out um, Nicholas, if you don't mind standing up, sorry to pick on you, but Nicholas Bassi works for the Global Development Lab and he's heading our diaspora work. And so if people are interested in engaging with us, um, uh, and looking at how we can work more deeply with the diaspora, Nicholas would be a great person to talk to. Okay, excellent. Okay, we have only about 11 minutes, so I'm gonna ask that people really, 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 really try to squeeze your comment statement into like 30 seconds. Right. Okay, my name is Chris Amadjuru. Uh, I'm a member of the All Progressive Congress in Nigeria. Uh, my question uh, directed towards Mrs. Uh, Anne Mai Cheng. Uh, yes, you remember, you remember the U.S. Uh, AD, uh, I mean, excuse me, is it U.S. Uh, AD, correct? Uh, te technolo technology uh, uh, Department. Uh, right now, currently in Nigeria, uh, in Nigeria, where I'm also from, there's a, a restructuring going on, and uh, ICT is very much needed right now in, in many areas, whether it be transparency, whether it be uh, uh, other sectors of the economy, agriculture, that can be directed towards uh, her, uh, well, uh, so my question uh, is, how can the USA, from a technology standpoint, uh, benefit Nigeria? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rami Duyile, the president and CEO of Image Consulting Group. And my question is to Ann Chang. I, I believe that my answer came from the part, latter part of your question. We focus on helping entrepreneurs to be able to expand globally. And as a small business, an entrepreneur here, how can we engage more with USAID to make our vision and our practical things that we're doing bigger so we can execute? And I had the privileged opportunity of living in the continent for five years. So I do know, like you said, here and there. And we have a group of people who are entrusting themselves to us to be that bridge. How can we engage USAID more to be able to deliver what they expect? Thank, Thank you. you. You guys are doing great. All right. Hi, my name is Yule Anderson. I'm with the African American Future Society, and we put together scenario developments and foresight for Africa and African Americans. I applaud the work you're doing at the Global Development Lab. I don't think a lot of the people here really understand what you do, um, and I asked a lot of the people here to um, investigate what foresight and future, scen future scenario analysis means. Um, I have a couple of comments. Uh, one of my comments is that uh, China will be building cities of the future in Africa. I think that the trade barriers are related to um, international cost of um, seas and airlines, and they need to be reduced. That's why American companies are not there. I think the other reason why, um, these are some of our scenarios, I think the other reason why the African um, continent is not being developed is because the contracts require the resources before they build a bridge. They want all the diamonds in Sierra Leone. And I've been there, and so they won't build a bridge or they won't put in electronic technology. So I just ask that many more people get involved in government foresight. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name's Tommy Osborne, and I'm from Madden Technologies. We take science, engineering, and policy to advance both the private and the public sector. My question is, how would you compare and contrast the strengths of the Chinese, the European Union, the BRICS, in particular Brazil and India, uh, and the North American continent in doing work in Africa, because we have different approaches 
and they are not restricted by our inability to pay fees to people who give contracts. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Abdirizak Musa from the Embassy of Kenya. I think I'm the first uh, of the government folks that Patricia referred to. Let me thank uh, all the panelists for their insights. I have one comment and one question. My comment, I think the, the cross-cutting theme has been America is missing in action. And here I would like to quote in an edit when President Obama was in, uh, in Kenya last year, there was an editorial. He was going to address a major gathering in Kasarani Stadium. And to get there, he was going to travel through Uhuru Highway. So the commentary was, as we welcome our son, let him remember that the beast will be traveling through a, a road built by China and he'll be addressing the Kenyans in a stadium built by China. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very, I mean, uh, I think that captured everything. Uh, my question is uh, on, on Beyond Agoa. There was also about the TPP. There has been this talk of uh, America being a, a Pacific nation. And I think America has also been missing in trying to support African regional integration. Because Beyond Agoa, we, we need to support Africa as one. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we really are down to 30 second time slots. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you for the last 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Ahmed Karbo. I'm from Sierra Leone. And I've had a couple comments here this morning on Sierra Leone. And I also thank you very much, Ms. Chang. Um, a lot of people have actually spoken about the issue that I want to talk about. But I just want to reiterate that it's very important that um, the diaspora, Africans in the diaspora, be engaged as far as investment. Because um, I can give you an example. When Ebola hits West Africa, most of the experts that went to West Africa cannot communicate with the language and the indigenous in, in, in Sierra Leone and the other countries. It makes it very difficult to actually deliver the, the resources that they brought in. So by you engaging the diasporans here, going back to my Nigerian um, ambassador here, it will make it easy for you guys, whatever, whatever you're doing, instead of brain drain, you're taking the brains back to Africa because you're engaging them and you'll be the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would like to thank uh, Congress member Karen Bass for I mean, coming up with this initiative. And uh, my name is Awal Wundisa from Oromo Community of Minnesota. So I have two questions. Uh, one of the questions is uh, directly to USAID, and especially the USAID mission in Ethiopia. And what is the USAID mission, especially in Ethiopia? Because there is no I mean, potential stakeholders or non-profits, those who are working in Oromia region or any other regions. It is just only operating in one or two regions in Ethiopia. And there is a lot of, I mean, things going on in Ethiopia, as most of you guys know. And we've been just reaching out to USAID, and we are not getting the response. And we, as a Oromo or a Ethiopian diaspora, we want to work with you. I mean, USAID, but you know, the feedback we are getting from USAID is just, the USAID just want to work only with the Ethiopian government. And the community in the grassroots, they are not getting any resource from the American people. The second question is on the economic narrative of Ethiopia. So everybody said that two or three, I mean, double digit growth of Ethiopian economy, but as you can see, you know, it is just going down the road. And so, what is the take on this from the panelists? Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to say uh, thank you to the uh, Congresswoman for her amazing uh, programs, including, uh, you know. Testing. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to say thank you to the Congressman for uh, bringing these issues, the African issues, and uh, especially also about the uh, Every uh, often she has uh, a special program called the Africa Policy uh, Breakfast. My question is, as uh, earlier said by Professor Morad Iqbal, uh, if the situations are not studied together with the, the election process and the economical process, what can be done on the long run? Because I know the United States done an amazing job the last eight years, especially the African, the African diaspora has had a, a very good feeling about the, an African-American uh, coming, being a president, and also the fact that he invited over 50 
uh, head of government and head of states, which brings closer. So the potential is there. So how can the United States work like the Chinese and the others and try to bring together, especially the African Americans, to get involved within Africa? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more. I saw the, the young woman standing there, ask, uh, who had been standing there for a while. And then we're gonna have to close out. All right, hi, my name is Kulani Jalata. Um, first, I'd like to thank this panel. Um, I really appreciate this conversation and this ability to give um, sort of feedback about current policies. Um, so my question is for Ms. Ann May Chang from USAID. Um, you mentioned that there was a successful development program in Ethiopia. So my question is particularly about Ethiopia. And um, as you know, Ethiopia is currently in a very chaotic um, condition, given that millions of farmers were about to be evicted last year from their land through a plan called the Master Plan, Addis Master Plan. And then a lot of protests erupted, um, which turned into this movement called the Oromo Protest Movement. And this is in the context in which the government doesn't represent the different groups within that country. And so there's a strong tie between economic and agri agricultural development and democratization. So my question, um, given that there's a Senate resolution that is asking the USAID soon to democratize or to promote democratization, how is the USAID actually going to do that? Thank you. It has to be quick. Hi, this is uh, actually uh, not particularly a question, but a response to a couple of the um, Speakers, I'm Jason. Oh, it still has to be quick. Okay, I'm okay. Jason. I'm Jason Fraser. I'm the uh, director for the Office of East African Affairs for USAID, okay. covering Ethiopia, Kenya, and, and some other countries in the region. USAID has always and will continue to promote democracy, uh, development, economic development in Africa, um, and in Ethiopia particularly. We are concerned, and we've always have been concerned. Statements have been made with respect to human rights and human rights violations on the ground in any country in which we work. With respect to the, I think, the gentleman who asked, why, why are we in just certain areas within Ethiopia? I, I, that, <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify. USAID doesn't, does, is not focused on particular areas or for particular ethnic groups. When we provide development assistance in a particular country, we provide it in conjunction with the government and with NGO partners in which we work. And so we're not identifying you know, the Amhara region or identifying the Afar region or any other region of a particular country like Ethiopia, but we are developing, providing development assistance throughout the country. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Hold on a moment. Okay, we, we have, have one a, more. We have a brief announcement. Um, good afternoon, ev good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank Congresswoman um, Karen Bass for this event, organizing this event, and for the panelists. I'm from the Embassy of Nigeria, and this is just to say that our um, Chargé d'Affaires is absent here today, although we'd like to thank our diaspora uh, representative, um, but the Chargé d'Affaires as ambassador is, is not here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you may be surprised to know we're not going to be able to answer all your questions. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close out. Uh, each of the panelists can take a minute to close out, and they can either respond to one of the questions or just make a summary statement. Thank you. Um, I think what I wanted to respond to, or kind of as part of my wrap up, is uh, the role of the diaspora. I think it's true that we see uh, the U.S. government in particular beginning to identify and to engage more through some of its initiatives. One of the things that I would ask as a member of the diaspora myself, but being African American and not being of a particular country, but someone who has been engaged with Africa for many years, and as many others who have really worked uh, and toiled on Africa policy and development programs uh, for three, four, five decades now, many of us, uh, for the agency to really look at its definition of what the diaspora is and what it should include. Indeed, the African Union looks at those who are outside and not just those who may have immediately come from a country 
as being part of the diaspora. And I say that because the last gentleman who spoke, when he spoke of the diaspora, he specifically indicated African Americans as well. And I think that when you look at uh, the levels of uh, contributions that we've made to this country, when you look at the types of programs and resources that we have, I would really like to ask the U.S. government in particular to allow that definition to be broadened and to allow those of us who are engaging to be able to engage more broadly with uh, the, uh, the, our brothers and sisters on the continent. Okay, representing the private sector, I'd like to ask for your help because I think uh, we've stated, all of us in one way or another, that the economic facts are right before us, that six of the 10 largest growing economies are in Africa. We don't have to keep repeating these facts, but we need to get to the bottom line is of why some US companies are going into Africa, why others aren't, and to help one another make this happen. I think that if more comp US companies are there in terms of investment, it will help to change the political climate. Uh, and it will also help to provide economic development, and it would help to bring in uh, the diaspora and small, medium-sized enterprises. So I look at the, uh, there is no other entity that can do economic development like the private sector. And uh, our country is a very good example of the private sector. We have problems, every country has problems, but the private sector can lead to economic growth and prosperity for uh, all people, and so I ask that you guys help us to get the, the private sector there in larger numbers. Thank you. Thank you. I thought I would answer the question about how people can engage with USAID. So across USAID, we have made it a priority to work with small and minority-owned businesses. We have an office called the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization that advocates on behalf of smaller businesses. And so we very much encourage smaller businesses to engage with us through any of our various different procurement mechanisms. Specifically for the Global Development Lab, we've really tried to lower the barrier to entry around engaging with USAID, particularly around innovation, because we believe that the best ideas can come from unexpected places and by bringing diverse perspectives together. So through our Development and Innovation Ventures Program, our grand challenges, our various prizes, and our co-creation mechanisms, we've tried to really lower the bar in terms of what is required to work with USAID, giving out small grants starting at $100,000 for ideas of uh, innovations that could be transformative to the way that we do development. And so I encourage you all, if you have good ideas of innovations that really could make a difference, to apply through any of these different programs. Some of them are open innovation mechanisms that will that um, work across sectors and geographies, and some of them are more targeted to specific problems that we've identified as priorities that we really are looking for solutions to. Um, so thank you. And. Um, one of the things I just want to end by saying is uh, thank you, Congresswoman Bass, for putting together such a fabulous panel and such a fabulous day today. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be here, and um, I think that it's important that we continue to talk about these issues because they're very, very complex and there's no easy answers. Thank you. Uh, and if I can put a plug in for uh, one community that has not been mentioned uh, that I think in addition to the NGO community, in addition to the government, uh, in addition to the private sector, uh, the role of scholars. And it's important that people who do research, who play a, a critical role in thinking about these issues, really do continue to understand uh, Africa's centrality to the development of the world. And so I would put a plug in for making sure that scholars are also engaged around these issues uh, scholars who've been around for a long time who've worked on these, but also new scholars that are emerging, uh, particularly in the areas of international studies, international development, international communications, uh, that those uh, areas do not forget about the role of Africa uh, as, they, as people continue their studies. So we're gonna end here. Thank you very much. Uh, stay around for the whole day and have a good day. He hasn't made it easy.